I want to talk for a few minutes this evening about this idea of everybody needs a wingman. Now, I know in this district, these are spiritual people. You guys don't see movies, but if you came in from another district, you may have seen Top Gun. Only the transfer people have seen movies in this district, so I get that. But everybody needs a wingman. Everybody needs a partner. Everybody needs somebody who's going to be with them through thick and thin. Everybody needs somebody who's not going to leave their side when a crisis hits. There was a, a professor from Fresno State University. I was speaking in Fresno not too long ago. He said prior to 1918, he researched all global pandemics and discovered that prior to 1918, no global pandemic lasted more than two or three months. And there were two reasons for it. Number one, there were no medications. You either lived or died. And number two, nobody went anywhere. They not only didn't go to another state or another country, they didn't go to another village. It came in, did what it was gonna do, and then was gone. So that means people who have led churches or organizations during the last two and a half years have led during the most difficult season in recorded history. Before I left for Convoy of Hope, I'd have an email of someone in the church saying, if you don't make everybody wear a mask, you'll never see me again. Followed by an email that said, unless you make everybody in the church wear a mask, you will never see me again. And the tension of that. And so what I want to do tonight, everybody in this room needs to be celebrated and cheered for leading during the most difficult season of recorded history. I want you to put your hands together and cheer for everybody in this room. You guys are heroes, heroes. So the Apostle Paul was one of these guys that kind of called it like he saw it and was a little rough on the edges, but he had friends around him who helped him navigate. He had some, some wingmen that were very important. In fact, if you start in the book of Romans and you go through Philemon looking at the names of friends of Paul, you will discover in that window of scripture, there are 45 names mentioned, specific names. There were probably many other names and friends of Paul's who encouraged and supported and built up, but they're not mentioned by name, but specifically 45 names. The apostle Paul was a tough dude. He could pretty much handle anything, but he still needed a wingman. He still needed people around him to, to build up and encourage. Before we get into the text tonight, I want to talk about one individual, specifically a guy by the name of Epaphroditus. Epaphroditus came out of a pagan environment, born to pagan parents, and somewhere along the way he encountered the gospel and was one of the faithful leaders at the church of Philippi. He was so reputable and so trustworthy that the church actually sent an offering to Paul via Epaphroditus. Unfortunately, Epaphroditus becomes physically ill after arriving in Rome, and the news had gotten back to Philippi. He had to go back because the church was worried about his, his health, and, and Paul wanted to make sure that he was okay and needing, uh, needing to let them know that they had sent this special guy to be with him. Paul knew that the Philippian believers intended for Epaphroditus to be with him, but he knew in this situation he needed to send him back. He returned home without completing his term of service to ease the, the fear and embarrassment and to help answer any questions. Paul wrote this glowing testimony for him, commending him in his incredible service. And it's just one verse found in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 25. I want you to hold on to this tonight because we're going to talk about it. it. simply says this, meanwhile... I think you'll see it on the screen. I thought I should send Epaphroditus back to you. Now look at this description from the Apostle Paul. He is a true believer, a true brother, co-worker, and fellow soldier. And he was your messenger to help me in my need. A true brother, a faithful co-worker, and a fellow soldier. Paul's saying, first of all, I want you to know that 
Epaphroditus not only shares with me common life, but he's like a brother to me. I have affection for him. He's a comrade. He's a friend. He has my back and I have his. This expression of my brother says a lot when Paul viewed him and expressed how he felt about him. Then there's this second passage of Scripture where Paul mentions two other dear friends by name, one book over in Colossians and has a similar expression of love and appreciation. It's in Colossians 4, 7 through 9. It's in Paul's final greeting, and this is Colossians 4, 7 through 9 from the Living Bible. Tychicus, our much-loved brother, will tell you how I'm getting along. Now listen to this description. He is a hard worker and serves the Lord with me. Now check out what Paul says here. I have sent him on this special trip just to see how you are and to comfort and encourage you. His sole purpose for this mission was to comfort and encourage you. And on in the verse it says, I'm also sending Onesimus, a faithful and much-loved brother, one of your own people. He and Tychicus will give you all the latest news. These are three really obscure names that a lot of people aren't familiar with. Epaphroditus, Tychicus, and Onesimus. And before we look at the characteristics of of how these guys were great friends and supporters and, and people that Paul needed in his life, I want us to look at a plague that is hitting every single person in this room. There is no one in this room who is exempt from this plague. And uh, Pastor Jim McNabb and I did not measure any notes before service, which how many of you know it's awesome when the Holy Spirit weaves things together without anybody knowing? It's called discouragement. And here are a few thoughts about discouragement that you might want to write down this evening before we get into God's word of of how we are supposed to act as, as brothers and sisters to lift each other up and encourage one another. Number one, discouragement is a universal disease that we all get. There's not a single person in this room who has never been discouraged. I talked to my brother-in-law this weekend and the Sooners were struggling a little bit and I could, I could hear the discouragement in his voice. Not a single person in this room has never been discouraged. Number two, unfortunately, it's reoccurring and you can get it more than once. There was a recent study by Barna that said over 1,700 pastors a month are quitting and leaving the ministry. 1,700 a month. Number three, discouragement is contagious and spreads quickly. How I many of you talk with someone and they start sharing how bad their life is and all of a sudden you just went in dumps? <laughs> just went right down with them. It's contagious. Number four, there's no vaccine for it. It's not a political statement, it's just it happens in life. And then number five, discouragement is both devastating and deadly. During this two and a half years, there have been more recorded pastors who have committed suicide than in any other season in the last 20 years. Think about that. What was the attendance? The board member. Were the offerings down? Well, I'm... I can't believe the music was so loud. It was so hot in there. Why don't they turn the air on? On and on and on. You hear those things week after week. It starts to chip at, chip away at you and bring you down. The most important thing that you and I can do is to make sure we stay encouraged. That's why I'm so thankful you came to this district event tonight. The greatest decision you could have made this week is to be here, to be lifted up, to be encouraged, to be built up. And and let me just tell you this. Be lavish with your encouragement and and your support for others. You know, I've heard people say, well, you know, if we tell them they're good too much, they're going to get the big head. In 28 years of ministry, I've seen more people die of a broken heart than a big head. 
Go for it. I saw, I think his name's Randy. I saw Randy uh, when he came up here as his first time here. I told Daryl, I said, well, at least I got a bodyguard in this room. Thank the Lord for that guy. Man, Oklahoma might need him this weekend. But um, okay, don't get discouraged, people. There's another week coming. The most, most important thing we can do is stay encouraged. Let me just kind of bring it to you for real tonight. Guys, your wife does not need a discouraged husband. Ladies, your husband doesn't need a discouraged wife. Build them up. Support them. Celebrate them. Recognize them. Ladies and gentlemen, your kids don't need discouraged parents. They need to know that you believe what you're saying and that God is in control and that he is more than enough and that he is faithful and we can walk through those valleys and still make it out the other side. They need to know that. So before we get into living out how we can be true brothers and sisters and what Paul described these friends to be, what can we drive an anchor in and what do we need to do? I'm not embarrassed to tell you there was a season in my life where I went through severe depression. I battled depression for a long time. And almost every night before I went to bed, I would open the Bible and read Psalm 27. It's the only passage of scripture that could give me peace before I put my head on the pillow at night. I'm not saying there aren't other passages. I'm saying this is what helped me. And I want to tell you tonight, these first three verses of Psalm 27 are life-changing from the Living Bible. The Lord is my light and my salvation. He protects me from danger. Whom shall I fear? When evil men come to destroy me, they will stumble and fall. Yes, though a mighty army marches against me, my heart shall know no fear. I am confident that God himself will save me. Friends, once you drive a stake in those three verses, you can, you can hold on to anything. It doesn't matter what comes your way. God's word never changes. His word is faithful. His word is absolute truth. You can trust him. I was thinking, uh, Daryl, today, the uh, voice of the martyrs that's in, Bar in Bartlesville. And uh, the guy who founded that, I read a quote on the plane today, and he's saying, if somebody comes and kills me, I just get to go be with Jesus. Like, it didn't even phase him. And when we can drive a stake into Psalm 27, one through three, once we have that anchor to stabilize our lives, now, okay, we've got that taken care of, how do I live out what it means to be a true brother and sister for the people who are sitting on my right and left tonight? How many of you wanna be that for the person on your right and left tonight? Number one, a true brother or sister is trustworthy, helpful, honest, reliable, protective, and supportive. How many of you look at that definition and go, oh yeah, buddy, I'd like some of that in my life. Someone who's trustworthy, someone who is helpful, someone who is honest, someone who is reliable, someone who is protective, someone who's supportive. That's what true brothers and sisters do. This is how Paul gave a description of Epaphroditus, Tychica, and Omenesis. This, this, is, this is Paul's description of what we should be like as a true brother and sister in the Lord. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse one says, keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. 1 Corinthians 14, 1 says, let love be your highest goal. What if we got up every morning and just said, you know what, today, 
I'm just going to go love everybody. That's my goal for the day. I'm going to go love everybody. Preston's back there. We'd have breakfast with our kids before they'd head out to school. Hey, listen, guys, before you head out, go love everybody today. Go love everybody. Let love be your highest goal. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen or heard of this, but there was a guy by the name of Patch Adams. Anybody ever heard of Patch Adams? It's a true story. Robin Williams uh, played the character in a movie, but he's a real person. Patch Adams had this desire to provide free health care for the poor and the suffering. And I heard not too long ago, you guys are looking at a picture, aren't you? Now, I told them to hold on to that, but they got it out there. So, a few months ago, I found out that Patch Adams was going to be in Springfield, Missouri. He was speaking to doctors and nurses in a private event. So I called this group that was hosting and said, I'm not a doctor or a nurse, but is there any way I could get some tickets to go to this event? They said, absolutely. Gave me two events, two tickets. Angie and I went. Didn't cost us anything. I thought this was going to be a massive event. There's 80 people in the room. I sat on the third row. I got to talk to Patch Adams himself after, the, after his lecture. But listen to this. At the end of his lecture, now this is an individual who I've never seen someone have a greater love for humanity than this individual. It's mind-blowing. So at the end, they let people open it up for a question and answer time. So there's a nurse that's sitting two seats from me. Uh, by the way, they wouldn't let Angie and I in the room unless you put a red nose on, which is pretty fun. I think we should wear red noses every Sunday morning, but that's a whole nother thing. So anyways, so uh, this lady sitting next to me, she asked this question to Patch Adams. This is what she says. I'm sure you've had this in a small group or some kind of icebreaker. This is what she said. If you could have lunch with anybody living or dead, who would it be? How many of you have ever had an icebreaker like that in one of your small groups or something? If you could have lunch with anybody, living or dead, who would it be? And, you know, people usually say, you know, Abraham Lincoln and David Letterman or, you know, somebody says something like that. Patch Adams does not even think. He doesn't process. Nothing happened. There was an instant response. He simply said this. She says, if you could have lunch with anybody, living or dead, who would it be? And Patch Adams looks right at her the third row and says, I've never met anybody I didn't want to have lunch with. Whoa. What if we actually loved people like that? What if no matter who we bumped into, what if you bumped into somebody in this room that you've never met and just said, I'd love to have lunch with you. That's a true brother or sister. That's someone who's not in the comparison game or, the, or competition. That's someone who genuinely cares about another human being. And if there's anybody who should lead that way, it should be us in this room. Amen? Being a true brother or sister means building bridges, celebrating victories, and mourning losses together. I was having lunch with our president a few weeks ago, and Hal said to me, what do you miss most about pastoring? And I think what I said shocked him. I said, I miss uh, weddings and funerals. He goes, what? I said, I miss celebrating with people on the happiest day of their life, and I miss holding their hand on the saddest day of their life. Preaching on Sunday mornings wasn't even on the radar screen. We are shepherds. I hear about leadership conferences and all these. Why don't we have a shepherding conference where we focus on caring for the broken and the hurting and those who just need a hand up? This is how Paul described these dear friends who meant the world to him. What do brothers and sisters not do? What should we stay away from? Well, James makes it crystal clear. Brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. 
Anyone who speaks against a brother or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you're not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on them. Please don't ever use your mouth to run someone down. A healthy mind, a healthy follower of Jesus Christ does not speak ill of others. They just don't do it. Gossip is the devil's cell phone. Let me encourage you just to hang up. If somebody comes to you with some information about another person in this room, what I want you to do is to look them in the eye and say, are you perfectly fine with me sharing with them what you just said? And I can promise you 100% they're not ever going to come back to you with information anymore. That's going to stop that right there. That's what true friends do. That's what trustworthy friends do. That's what loyal friends do. That's what faithful friends do. They don't look for the, the blemishes and the dents and the dings. They look for the best in people, and they celebrate them, and they believe in them, and they push them forward because this isn't a competition. We're all on the same team. Philemon 1.7 says, your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the Lord's people. Let that be your goal every weekend. Refresh the hearts of the Lord's people. How do you refresh someone? I'm a real practical guy. Daryl was the brains at CBC. I was the guy that was telling stories in the cafeteria. So I have to have things real simple and clean and clear. So how do you refresh someone? Let me make these suggestions tonight. Get into the habit of using phrases like this. I value you. You've got this. You're not alone. I see the good in you. And this one, this is a zinger at the end. You can count on me. When I was going through a dark season, I had a friend come and pray with me at the altar, a missionary. And this is the prayer that he prayed in my ear. It was life-changing put his arm around me at the altar, and he whispered in my ear, God, when Brad is in need of intercession, I ask you to awake me from my sleep to pray for him. What if that's how we really felt about every person in this room? The person sitting beside you who may be so discouraged tonight and they've got a smile on their face because they don't want anyone to know. But if they heard someone whisper in their ear, God, when Jamel is in need of prayer, when he is in need of intercession, would you please awake me from my sleep to pray for him? That's a faithful friend. That's a loyal friend. That's someone who is reliable. That's someone who is trustworthy. Number two, Paul describes these obscure friends as faithful co-workers. And this definition is they're faithful, dependable, loyal, devoted, committed, stable, and sincere. How many of you look at this and go, man, I... Yeah, I'd love 10 of these friends. How many of you are with me tonight? Proverbs chapter 28 and verse 20 says, a faithful man will abound with blessings. When it comes to relationships, remaining faithful is never an option. It's a priority. Being a faithful friend is what God calls us to be. And let me just say this, loyalty is everything. 
Let me try that in this section. Loyalty is everything. Don't cut anybody's legs out on your staff. If you're a staff pastor, don't cut your senior pastor's legs out. Only speak good of him and honor him and celebrate him. Are they perfect? No. Do we all make mistakes? Yes. Be this kind of coworker. And for churches who are in the same cities with other churches, the greatest thing my father left me, he pastored in the same city for 40 years with his best friend who pastored 10 miles away in the same city for 40 years. I'm not talking about, oh, he's a good guy. I probably got some people from my church over there. I'm talking about our families vacationed every summer together. And let me just say this, comparison is the great joy stealer. Don't do it, don't fall for that trap, don't get in that game, it's not worth it. All it does is rob you of joy in your life. Celebrate other churches' victories. When something great happens at another church, be their biggest fan. Comment on their Facebook posts. I'm so happy to see what God is doing there. I'm grateful for your leadership. I'm thankful for your friendship. I'm glad we get to do this together. A faithful man will abound with blessing. Abound here is defined as to occur or exist in great quantity or number to be rich or well supplied, to be filled. When we are faithful, we will be rich, well supplied, and filled with God's blessing more than we could ever imagine. I don't know about you, that's, to me, that's a good incentive to be faithful. But really, how important is faithfulness in our relationships? Is faithfulness really that big of a deal? Well, John had something to say about it. In Revelation 2.10, he said, be faithful unto death. Well, I don't know about you, that sounds pretty important. <laughs> it, you can giggle, it's okay. I had a surgery not too long ago, a few years ago. They had to take out 18 inches of my colon, and I said to the doctor, am I dying? He goes, you started dying the day you were born. I was like, oh, okay, all right, I guess I won't worry about it. Be faithful to death, and I will give you a crown of life. Let me just throw this out there. There is no possession more valuable than a faithful friend. Please, be the brother and sister that the person on your right and left need in this district. Number three. He gives us a little military background. He says they're, they're a fellow soldier. And a soldier is well-trained, brave, focused, selfless, undaunted, generous. I don't know if you know about this, but once somebody's been in war with somebody, you know, band of brothers, or those guys would do anything for their brother. Nothing is off the table. In ministry, it's, it's actually a, a very similar situation. Whether you like it or not, whether you signed up for it or not, when you answer the call, there's a big target on your back that the enemy has for you. And because of that, we need to lock arms, not clench fists. 1 Corinthians 15, 58, therefore, my brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Soldiers stand firm in the midst of adversity. Courage doesn't mean you don't get afraid. Courage means you don't let that fear stop you. Be the kind of friend who protects and defends 
and covers the back of people in your life. The Apostle Paul addressed this at the church in Corinth. He says, be on your guard, stand firm in the faith, be courageous, be strong. You've heard the story of a man who sees a six-year-old little boy carrying another little boy almost as big as him, and the man commented, you got quite a load there, don't you, little man? The young boy replied, why, he ain't heavy at all. He's my brother. Everyone's a whole lot easier to carry and to cover when they're your brother. You get the choice to do that. Let me close with a few thoughts this morning or this evening. I woke up at 3.30. <laughs> I don't even know what city I'm in right now. <laughs> this has nothing to do with the message, but my assistant called me a few weeks ago, and she goes, where are you? And I said, I, don't, I have no idea where I am. She said, well, you're supposed to be in Huntsville, Alabama. And I go, I looked at the hotel phone. I said, yeah, that's where I am. I've slept in six different hotels in the last eight days. So, yeah, it's good morning, good evening, whatever you want it tonight. Let me close with these few thoughts. The enemy always wants to isolate, interrogate, and cause disunity. That's why COVID has been so horrific, because we were never meant to be isolated. We were created for community. We were never meant to do life alone, ever. In fact, psychologists will tell you that solitary confinement, isolation, is the worst punishment they can give the most vile criminals. That's why we need each other. We all hurt, but thank God we don't all hurt at the same time because we need each other. We need each other. Nobody's exempt. God wants us to connect, encourage, and walk in unity, the exact opposite of what the enemy wants. I want to show you a picture that I took a few years ago when I was in Tanzania. I took this picture, and then I showed it to the guy driving my Jeep. And he says to me, you captured the leadership lessons of the zebra. And I was like, what? He goes, in that one picture, you captured the leadership lessons of the zebra. I said, what does that mean? He said, even in a large group, they still hang out in pairs of two. He said, the second thing is, they face the opposite direction to cover each other's backs. And then listen to this last one. When they're tired, they lean on each other. Wow. If God designed zebras to do this, how much more does he want us to be tethered together to cover each other's backs and to lean on each other when we're tired. You say, man, you're emotional. I'm tired. I, did I tell you I got up at 3.30 this morning? Here's what I want to do. It's a minister's retreat. I want to ask all of you in this room, to go all in so that if Paul was writing a description of you, he would say, Daryl, man, that guy's a true brother, a faithful co-worker, and a committed soldier. I want every person in this room to commit to go all in to being the actual description that Paul described his friends. I want to pray a scripture over you this evening, and then we're going to have some time of prayer at the altar. So I'd like for you all to stand, please.
going to put this verse on the screen. Here's my prayer for you tonight. May you be completely faithful to the Lord our God. May you always obey his degree, decrees and commands just as you are doing today. Pastor Jim mentioned it earlier tonight, and I just love how the Holy Spirit does those things. And I don't know how we can do this, but we're going to try to do it just to fill this entire area. If you want God's favor and blessing on your life, if you want God's favor and blessing on your family, if you want God's favor and blessing on your church, if you want to be the friend and true brother that God has called you to be, true sister that he's called you to be, if you want to embrace those qualities and be that for the person on your right and left, I just want you to come fill this front area. We're going to pray. We're going to have, we're going to have the presbyters up here, Pastor Daryl, his team. I just want you to come fill this altar and just take a moment because when we reflect on God's goodness with gratitude, that's when discouragement disappears. Let me try that again. When we reflect on God's goodness with hearts of gratitude, that's when discouragement disappears.